this afternoon's presentation. Excuse me. Go back. Before we begin, we'll just do um, just some quick logistical um, things. For any students who are attending this presentation here this afternoon, you can go ahead and send your student ID number in a private message to Jeremiah, um, who is on this call, and he will take down your student ID for the presence check-in, okay? So again, if there are any students in this call this afternoon, go ahead and send your presence check-in to Jeremiah and in a private message, and he will take down your student ID for the presence check-in, okay? But I will be glad to begin this presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Anchetta. I will be your facilitator slash your host for this afternoon's um, wonderful presentation that we have with this Share the Joy um, uh, piece to this afternoon. Um, so why don't we begin with an opening prayer before our presentation begins? So if we can just all center ourselves um, and remember that we are in the presence of the Lord, um, so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of community, and the gift of friendship, and the gift of sharing knowledge, and the gift of sharing wisdom with each other. Um, we ask that you bless our time here this afternoon, that we all open our minds and our hearts to the experiences that we might listen to and hear this afternoon. We thank you for the many blessings and opportunities you continue to give us throughout our lives. And we ask for your continued guidance and blessing as we all continue to carry our crosses on our journeys. We thank you for this day and we thank you for our presenters this afternoon. And we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are very blessed this afternoon to have some friends from the Wali House um, here locally in the state of Hawaii, on the island of Oahu. Um, and today they will be sharing the joy of being a Catholic worker. Um, so if you can both just briefly introduce yourselves and you can feel free to go ahead and start your presentation. I think you might still be. There, there you go. <laughs> Can you hear me now, Andrew? Okay, I see your thumb. Okay, I'm Wally Inglis, and sitting right next to me is Barbara Bennett, and we're sitting in the small chapel meditation room here at our local Catholic worker house. And uh, I am an old man. <laughs> I am in my early 80s. This whole world of Zooming, and I, I sure wish that we were all sitting together around a big table or in a classroom at Chaminade. I did teach at Chaminade in the 80s uh, for, for a year. And uh, at that time, the, the highest tech that I knew was uh, a piece of chalk and an eraser. So this whole world is new to me, but I'll do my best. Uh, so I'll let Barbara introduce herself and then uh, I will be starting our presentation, just giving a little history of the Catholic worker movement, the people involved, the spirit behind it, and then we'll zoom down on the on local picture. But, uh, say hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, I am kind of an old person, not <laughs> as old as Wally. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I've been a Catholic worker more or less in, in a variety of ways, I'll share that later, all of my adult life. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that, but it's really been an honor to be here in Hawaii and serving the Wally House and being a part of this ministry. And I, I think we'll just go yeah. ahead and start. Okay, and one more thing before launching into the the more uh, instructional part of all this. Uh, there's the picture right there of our house, and we invite you to come and see us. Yeah. You know, we're in Palama. We're just a few doors down from Thomas Shiro's Fish Market. Next to, we're on the campus of St. Elizabeth's Church. Uh, 
our neighbor church is Kamakapili Church, United Church of Christ. So uh, you're welcome to come, and we're always looking for volunteers to help us with our work. And maybe later we can be more specific about that. So there's the house right there. Uh, unfortunately, it, it bears my name. Uh, <laughs> I was always under the impression you had to die before they named anything after you. Uh, but in this case, uh, other greater minds thought otherwise. But anyway, the, the history of the Catholic worker movement, uh, we focus on two people. They're co-founders, uh, both uh, very radical people. Dorothy Day, uh, a famous person. Uh, she lived from 1897 to 1980. And Peter Morin, not so famous person. He lived from 1877 to 1949. But, uh, even though Dorothy is the, the most well-known, uh, when Pope Francis came within the last two or three years, I forget exactly when, but he spoke in Congress to uh, both houses of Congress, and he named three or four people that he saw as leading figures in the American church. And uh, in that number, along with Thomas Merton, and he mentioned uh, Martin Luther King, but he mentioned Dorothy Day. Uh, Although Dorothy claims it was Peter Morin, a French peasant, a man who didn't quite care how he was dressed, who walked around with stuff sticking out of his coat pocket, very simple person, but a very wise person. But he was, according to her, and she claimed this for her whole life, that he was the, uh, the founder uh, of the Catholic Worker. And it was he who completed her education uh, as a Catholic. She was not born into the church. She was born into a family, essentially no religion. She may have been baptized, but, uh, but she said she, in, and she's written a lot of books. I mean, uh, I don't know if uh, you're not looking at us here, but I have a whole- Are, are you seeing our picture? Hello? Oh, didn't need it. Uh, uh. Yes, we can see you. Okay, oh, okay. Oh, okay, very good, sorry. All right. No, I, no worries. I ha we have this your your large photo up, and so we're not seeing like all the people. I don't know how to get out of that. Right, right. So, That's okay. Yeah. We we don't need to. As long as we, I know we're not speaking into dead air here. Uh, <laughs> but the, for, Andrew, could you? We had we sent some pictures of Dorothy and Peter. Could yes. Could oh, you, this I have I have the slideshow up. You can tell me when to switch the the slides for you okay you, you can switch please you oh. can switch please yeah so the two people that we're talking oh, about yeah we're yeah. in the I, keep going please i would like to get to the pictures of dorothy it's at the end andrew backwards. There, okay. wait, yeah there we go there's uh dorothy okay so there is a uh, an iconic picture of dorothy uh, and uh another reason for being quote famous as i mentioned in the beginning that she currently is a candidate for sainthood in the catholic church uh, so an artist has portrayed her in the saintly mode with the halo but holding in her hand is this very radical newspaper the catholic worker which first came out in 1933 uh, in new york it was during the, the depths of the great depression and uh, this was a paper that uh, she and Peter and others put together and they peddled it on the street for a penny a copy. You know, they, they, they lived in a very rundown building but they would go out to Wall Street and other places and sell their, uh, uh, sell their newspaper, the Catholic Worker. So can we see a picture of Peter somewhere here? I think uh, if you continue down our, this is the logo, this is the Catholic Worker. Yes, Peter. There we go, okay. Right. So the, the, the image of Peter, he was a peasant, and it was he who, who brought to the Catholic worker movement the very importance of working the land, caring for the land, being sensitive to that part of creation. So he was well before his time. He probably never heard the term ecologist, but uh, uh, it was his, his analysis of society that we were over-industrialized, that we were impersonalized. Personalism 
one-to-one uh, -one, uh, communication was very much part of his philosophy in the Catholic worker, but that, that we needed to be in smaller units. We needed to be working the land. And so uh, today there are over 200, 250 Catholic workers throughout the country, throughout the world. Some of them are located on farms. You know, we're, we're located right here in the middle of Tali'i Palama, in a very small piece of land, but, but we're committed to the idea of taking care of the land. We have a garden here. We have a small orchard, as we're speaking now. We're looking out the window of our little chapel here. Uh, there are mulberry trees, and there's citrus trees, and there's lily flavor. So uh, that's a very important aspect of, of the Catholic worker. Um, as long as... Uh, so we, uh, Next photo, please. There we go. Oh yeah. Okay. So there are the two folks right there sitting down. This is shortly after uh, after they met. You know, in the early '30s, Dorothy had been a an activist with socialist, communist uh, leaning causes all through the '20s. Uh, she was uh, to get women the right to vote. And then ironically, she herself never voted. Uh, she claimed that uh, somehow she didn't have enough faith in the system, but she had enough conviction that we had that right, that women had the right. Uh, so, I, I, and one of her pilgrimages to Washington, D.C., protesting this or that, she went into the Catholic cathedral. She was not yet a member of the church by any means, but she prayed that somehow she said, I've been haunted by God all my life, you know, and I, I'm looking for some way to link my interest in social justice with spirituality. I haven't found that yet. I haven't found that link. And uh, later on, she said, this is the man that God sent to me. And he sent to me, and, and together we were able to wed these two ideals of changing structures, not just treating symptoms, radical changes in society, also radical changes in personal spirituality. So these were very dedicated, very traditional Catholics, but in their political thinking, their social thinking, uh, they were way out there on the cutting edge long before their time. Do you want to add anything to that? No. Next picture, please. That's good. Okay, so there's Dorothy. That's an, uh, another iconic picture. You know, it's not a halo surround. That's a, a hat trying to shelter her from the sun in the middle of the grape fields of California. That picture was taken in the middle of the 1970s, where she had gone to support Cesar Chavez and the farm workers who were seeking better working conditions in the fields, the right to organize, to form a union. And she felt very strongly. She took a bus all the way from New York to California. At that point, she was uh, in her mid-70s. Uh, but all her life, she was dedicated to the working person. Very early in, her, uh, in the days of the Catholic worker, a new member of the church, she went and supported grave diggers. These were grave diggers in a Catholic cemetery in New York who were trying to organize a union, you know, a right that popes going back into the previous century said that they had. The Archbishop of New York was uh, not recognizing that right. She supported the, uh, the strikers. So labor, the right of people to organize, to have dignity and work, was always one of Dorothy's causes, along with the works of mercy. And that's why we have Catholic worker houses, feeding hungry people, providing shelter, providing clothing, the things that we do here at our house and Catholic worker houses throughout the country. Do we have another slide here? I think there's another slide. One more, maybe. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, okay. So we need to go back to the beginning of the slides. Um, okay. There, that was it. Beginning the other one with Wally. Yeah, we go. That's perfect. Okay. Um, 
So the Catholic worker paper that Dorothy was holding in that icon, ah, uh, yeah, the Catholic worker paper, my husband subscribed to, and I hadn't seen it before I was 21 years old, but at that point I was married and he subscribed to it. And so every day, every month it came in our mailbox. And so I started reading it out of curiosity. Um, he was a priest and an Episcopal priest, and we lived in a rectory right next to the church, like, uh, like here, like <laughs> Wally House. And, and so I thought, oh, I can do that. And so I just started, whoever came to my door, I just started feeding them. And occasionally we had a rather large house. And so occasionally if somebody seemed desperate, um, I would give them a place to stay for a while. And, and I carried on in that style of Catholic work for pretty much all the years of raising my children. So I never advertised or hung out a sign that this is a Catholic worker. But being married to a priest always put us in a place where people kind of knew where the pastor lived and would knock on the door. And I would take advantage of that and um, start feeding people and then word would get out and oh, you can always go there to that house and get something to eat. So whether we were next to the church or not, that just word of mouth, never really a formal affiliation until my children were grown. And, and then I started to um, join some of the other Catholic worker communities to see what it was really like. So I, I spent some time at a farm, sheep ranch in the Sierras um, of California. It's off grid and actually happened to be there when they put in a um, solar system. And that was a very interesting thing to learn. And, and that, ran, uh, that sheep ranch had a farm, um, a lot, they had a lot of property, um, but we had areas that we cultivated. And then they, we would drive into San Francisco and pick up folks that suffered from AIDS and bring them out to the farm where they could rest and we would give retreats. And we did that uh, probably once a month or every six weeks. So our ministry with others was giving these weekend retreats and then the rest of the time we worked the land. And then I lived for about a year in the Oakland Catholic Worker, which is a very different experience. Um, Oakland being very urban, and uh, that was a place where we had people knocking on our door all the time. We cooked a hot meal every day. And then when people would come, we would give them a plate. It always had beans and rice because there were a lot of Latinx in that area. And then whatever else that was donated that we could come together. So we had, we had enough people in the community that we would have an assigned day of, okay, today you're the cook. And so you'd have to go and get the beans and the rice going right away and then look and scrounge around and see what else you could make to go with it. Um, we also had a live-in community of immigrants that were having trouble with um, housing or finding a job. There were probably about six from a, from a variety of um, South American countries. And from Oakland, I went to Brazil and we started a Catholic worker house in Southern Brazil. And there were just the two of us my partner and I, and um, we did not have anything residential, but we did a lot of work with children of trying to, there were a lot, there, in Brazil there's a lot of street children, and so we played with them, trying to teach them English, giving them some opportunity to make art, and the kids, they really liked it, it was good. 
that was a, that was a very different kind of experience. But again, we always had a garden. We always were um, growing food for people. And if people came to the door, we would have food for them. That's so that for me as a Catholic worker, I think the two elements that have been the most consistent have been having a garden, so fresh produce to give and just work in the land and the Peter Moran's whole idea of how important that is. And then having food available for people, trying to feed whoever comes to the door. Um, yeah. So just a quick word about how we ended up in this house. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at our brightly colored Catholic worker house. This house was originally the rectory, the priest's house here at St. Elizabeth's uh, Episcopal Church. And uh, at some point, the, the current rector, David Gerlach, uh, did not need this house. He had his own house. The house was not being uh, fully used. So we came up with the idea of let's try doing a Catholic worker house. Uh, David, uh, as a young uh, seminarian, had been exposed to the Catholic worker. The same with me. I was in the Marino uh, Foreign Mission Society. As a seminarian, I met Dorothy Day in New York. I didn't know her, but I did meet her. And I did, uh, and I guess I've been haunted with the idea most, most of my life that it would be nice to, to be able to start one. So we had the, the opportunity here, we had the motive, uh, and uh, so we had to fix this place up. It didn't look as nice as it's looking now. I mean, this is the outside, the inside is very nice as well. We've got a lot of people to chip in, and it's been an ecumenical venture from the beginning. Yeah. We're probably the only Catholic worker, you know, on the grounds of an Episcopal church. You know, the, the Catholic yeah. worker began as strictly Roman Catholic, but over, I think if you go to any, any one of the 250 houses in the world, we're uh, a, an amazing mix. And we, we've gotten help from a lot of different religious organizations. Uh, a good bit of the food that we serve to people at our hot lunch comes from the Mormons. Mormons have a, a food storehouse just a few blocks from here in Kaligi. They gave us a grant, a very generous grant. Uh, we have Quakers, people from the Friends Meeting up in Manoa, who come and, and take responsibility for cooking and serving a meal every so often. So that's been one of the joys, I think, that uh, aside from helping people, of doing our bit to help bring different religious traditions together to work uh, cooperatively in common cause. So yeah. that's the house. So what do we do now, Barbara? Here? So yeah. what do we do now? How did I end up in Hawaii? Father David put out a, a call. He was looking for Franciscan Catholic workers. And I am a member of the Third Order Society of St. Francis, which is the Episcopal yeah. arm of the secular Franciscans. And I'm a Franciscan Catholic worker. There's not very many of us out there. And I had just come back from Brazil and wasn't sure what next. And this came available. So uh, my partner, David, and I, we, we responded. Apparently, we're the only ones that responded. And we came and helped open the house. And it's in three years, we've had a lot of, a lot of changes. Um, we started our the first first when we got here we just got to try to get to know people we had an encampment right basically in our backyard um that encampment has since been moved but it was kind of convenient for us because we were able to just go out and start getting to know this group of people and and we're still um friends and see them regularly even though they don't live right here they still come to the house and so they they kind of said the first thing we need is laundry being done. So we, our, our, the first thing we did when we opened the house was we started doing the laundry for the people that lived on the street. And that was really about all we did for a while. Father David did some of the food handout out of his office. And then eventually that transitioned to here. And that's now become the primary thing we do is handing out groceries to people. And I would say pre-pandemic, we probably served oh, 600 people a month. And now it's up to 4,000. Um, 
maybe more than 4,000. So we've really seen a shift. When we began, most of our ministry was with the houseless and we had the laundry and then we built a shower, we put in a shower where they could come shower. So they had that the whole complete, you know, they could get showered, their clothes cleaned and kind of feel fresh for a day. Um, and, and then we had to close that down with the pandemic and we've seen our population shift from primarily being homeless to being families, a lot of families, um, service, a lot in the service, the hotel workers, restaurant workers that have been laid off. We have to, we get our food from the food bank. And so we have some government forms that we have to fill out. And one of the questions is, are you employed? And, oh man, so many people say, I was employed, I'm now laid off. It, I hear it just over and over and over again. So that's, um, that's been difficult. And yet, um, I'm glad we're here and, and able to help put some food on people's uh, tables. We also have once a week, Kay's Cafe, Kay being Wally's wife. And it's a hot meal that we serve. And we started out with what, about 60 people? And now we're up to about 160, I think. And I, I, I don't think we're gonna go any bigger than that. It's just a, too hard for the space we have and, and the way it works out. When we, when we first opened Kay's Cafe, it was really like a cafe. People came and sat at the tables and sat around and were served and um, were able to have a nice, hot, relaxing meal. And now it's a takeout like so many restaurants and people just come and grab the food. You can see in this picture here, that table with the little box on it. And that's, that's how we, yeah, that's how we do our serving now. People have stand, people used to go through that gate and come to the house, but now they stand outside the gate. Um, and we interview through the fence. We stand on one side, they're on the other side. And we're all wearing masks. And if people don't have a mask, we go get them one. We provide that um, when needed. And we ask the few questions we have to ask. And we have people that are singles. And so we have a bag that caters to single people. And then we have a larger bag that caters to families, if it's family. And then we bring it out and we set it on that table. And then the person takes it off the table. And the little boxes, if there's something in there they don't want, they can put it in there. And then the next person comes along and says, oh, can I have this? And so then they take it out. And I found at the end of every day, it's always empty. So it, it gets filled and it gets emptied. So that, that process works. Um, and so when we have our lunch, then we, move, we open the gate all the way up and we set the table in front of the, at the gateway right there so nobody can walk into the house. And we basically just serve on that table just um, serving the meals out. And that seems to work pretty well too. So one final thing, maybe they want to start asking questions. I don't yeah. know, but we think we've gone over well over 20 minutes, but this is also a post office you're looking at. The, uh, the, a lot of the people who, who oh, right. live on the street, they, they don't have mailboxes. So uh, they're able to have their mail forwarded uh, to, uh, to our house. And lately, some of them have been picking up some checks the stimulus checks. Stimulus checks that they never knew they were entitled to. Yeah, we okay. help with that. We yeah. help people fill out the paperwork so that they could get get the stimulus check that most yeah. other people got delivered to their house weeks or months ago. Anyway, I think we're following it. Yeah, and the, well, the only other thing I would want to mention is that we charge devices. So oh, yeah. folks on the street, they um, a lot of people have battery packs now. So we. We charge them up for them and their phones. And uh, that actually is, it sounds so simple and it's actually one of the most challenging of the things we do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, but it's an important part of our ministry. I would say that we, we feed people and charge devices. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Andrew, you're still awake. <laughs> Yes, sir. I, I've been attentive to your presentation. <laughs> I'm, loving I'm loving it. I 
I love both. Okay, so you take us where you want to go now. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, so thank you for sharing us your, your experiences. I loved hearing your story, hearing both of you talk about, you know, what it is that you do. It's very inspiring to hear, um, you know, especially for someone like me who, you know, I hope to, to aspire to do as much social justice work as you guys do um, one day in my life. Um, but for everybody that's listening, if you have any questions for, for them, you can feel free to either unmute yourself and you can say it to the group, or you can put it in the chat as well and I can read the question to them for you. Um, but I can go ahead and get us started. I do have a question um, for you. So for either of you or for both of you, do you have an experience or a, a memory that you have that just, you know, reminded you like, oh, this is why I do what I do. Like, do you have a, a big moment like, oh, this is definitely why I signed up or why I dedicated my life to do this? Oh, boy. You know, that's, that's such an interesting question because kind of a bunch of things are popping up. And, and in general, some of our folks are really challenging. And... And the moment when there's a real connection, like there's one woman who she was so mad at me, she poured the Gatorade I'd just given to her over my head. And I was just like, ah, oh, you know, and I was so tempted to call the police, but I didn't. And then a week later, I found out it was her birthday and I was able she, we give out can openers, or we try to, because a lot of it's canned food, and the people on the street can't open it. And she had lost so many, we, we didn't give them to her anymore. And so it was her birthday, so I ran in, and I got her a can opener and gave it to her. And, and she was just so happy, and, and I was happy. And that was just, it, it was just really a nice moment to um, be able to greet someone who, can so often be difficult to work with in a positive moment. Yeah. So that's uh, a simple little story. I don't know if you have one. Yeah, I mean, I'm not here nearly as much. Barbara lives in this house. And she's here around the clock. And I come and go. I live in the Palo Alto Valley. And uh, so I'm not here all of the time. But I do stay at that gate and I meet people. And, and before I burned out as a teacher at Chaminade, I, I taught at Marino for a number of years, uh, social studies, English, but at least twice since I've been here, I've had former students. You know, people come and they look at me and I look at them, oh my God, you know, these were kids that I taught and, and they recognize now they're living in the street. You know? and so I mean, just uh, the ability to help them in another way, you know, uh, you know, I think I helped them teaching them something maybe, but uh, <laughs> to be able to give them some food, you know. Uh, that's still a Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Mr. Wally, I graduated from Marino in 2017. Oh, what year? <laughs> 2017. Oh, wow. I was in another era. I was there <laughs> 70s and I left in 83. Nice. My wife was nice. there until she was there 30 years or more. So she had more stamina than I did. I got tired early, but I loved it. I loved teaching at Marino. It was a good school. And it's always nice to meet Marino folks. Awesome. So does anybody have any questions for Mr. Wally or Miss Barbara? Feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask, or you can type it in the chat and I can read it for you. They're all at home. <laughs> They're on the freeway. <laughs> Is there anything we can throw in there? Well, while I can thinking? tell another story. Tell a joke. Tell no. a joke. <laughs> no. Um, no, I can. If you move on the slides, if you could sure. go to the next slide. That's um, one. That's our logo: the Franciscan Tau Cross and the Hawaiian Islands. We just threw that in because we had the Catholic Worker logo, so we got. But go to the next slide, please. 
There we go. Um, we put in a peace garden this last year, which has a series of raised beds and an uh, aquaponics sy uh, system as well. And we finished it up right when the pandemic hit. So we haven't been able to use it a lot for the community to join in. But we have been growing food. And one of the first things, one of the first plants that was given to us was, was oregano. Um, and so I, I planted it this, and it came from um, a friend um, from the Makaha farm. You want to say a little more about who Gigi is? Oh, Gigi, it's a, a farm in, uh, in Makaha, right next to Makaha Elementary School. And anyway, we've had a long friendship and they've been helping us try to get off yeah. the ground with our farming. Right, and so he, he brought me three different plants to start the garden. And there was this oregano, which I didn't even know what it was because it was a succulent. And I always thought oregano was this little tiny leaf. And so he said, no, no, it's oregano. So then I researched it and it's a succulent, but tastes and behaves just like oregano. So you can use it. So we planted it and it, oh man, it grew beautifully. This is a picture of it. And, and so when we harvested it, we put it out on that table we showed you for people to come and um, take it whoever wanted it and you know some people are like what is this and they're curious and some people took it to try it and some people said nah i don't think so and then this group of three filipino women came oh look what you have they were so excited mm. this is the best medicine and i was like what and they said <laughs> oh it's so good for congestion and coughs and oh my gosh can we have some and i said of course that's what it's there for and I brought them bags and they just kept filling their bags. They were so excited. And apparently the succulent, um, it has that moisture so you can make a juice out of it. And so that's what they use for their medicine. So that, you know, that's a story that you do something and you make an effort and, and you donate and then, and then we get back so much more. I mean, I had no idea that this plant existed and, and so one friend taught me about that and then how that's used and the medicinal property was another thing. And I'm all the more richer for growing the oregano. <laughs> so, anyway. So we, we do have a, a question that came in in the chat. Um, uh -huh. So Dorothy has an interesting and at times had had an interesting and at times difficult life how has her life inspired you all in your life and ministry? Ah, oh, you want to start? Or? Yeah, okay. Um, what, what inspires me and it helps is that she's not the typical saint. You know, I think all of us in this, we strive in our own way to be better people, to live better lives. And uh, this was a woman who, who who struggled. She, uh, she, as a young woman, she had a, an abortion. She, uh, she grieved over that. Then she later had a man she fell in love with. They had a child, but she at that point was committed to the church and uh, uh, they could not marry. So she, as a single mother, raised her daughter who had then eight daughters, eight grandchildren of their own. And, uh, I guess that that when I think about holiness or or sanctity or trying to be uh, that that there are so many ways to arrive at that, and the fact that Dorothy Day uh, came a much different way than most of us and was able to overcome adversity, and uh, you know she because of her radical political views she. You know, she was maligned very much you know, in her days, but she was, she was just so dedicated to her work. So I don't know if that's a very good answer, but it's some of what I feel when I, when I look back on, on her example. For me, I, it, it's just the simplicity of just doing what you can to try to feed people or give them shelter or clothe them and not get all philosophical about it or having them 
make a big organization about it. I mean, the Catholic workers, while there's a number of them, we aren't affiliated in any formal way. We, we have a, a email site where we can share, you know, you can look up on the Catholic Order site, you can look up where all the houses are and what basically they do, but there's no real affiliation. Um, and, and that to me has always been just from the start, you know, I didn't have to hang out a sign. I didn't have to join a group. I could just open the door and say, would you like a sandwich? And go from there. And I think that to me is my primary inspiration, the simplicity. I would definitely agree. That's an that's a awesome, awesome answer. Uh, yeah, the, just a little quote here. I was in preparing for this. And there's so many books about Dorothy, but there's a book here by a man named Robert Ellsberg, who's a publisher of Orbis Books, which is the Marion Old Fathers and Brothers Publishing house. Uh, Robert is the editor, publisher of all of those. But he wrote a book called The Saint's Guide to Happiness. And I was thinking, we're going to be talking about joy, you know, that uh, joy, happiness, uh, you know, the Beatitudes, which which say, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are persecuted. Well, in other translation, that blessed becomes happy. You know, happy are the, happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are the merciful. And uh, Ellsberg begins his book here with a quote from Dostoevsky, the Russian novelist, whom uh, Dorothy was addicted to. Hear. You know, she read everything he ever wrote. She was felt very close to uh, Dostoevsky. And uh, just this quote opens the book, and it's not all about Dorothy Day, but for we are made for happiness. And anyone who is completely happy has a right to say, I am doing God's will on earth. All the righteous, all the saints, all the holy martyrs were happy. And, uh, and so later on, Ellsberg said, uh, you know, that, that by inventing a new model of holiness, she found her way to happiness. So, uh, you know, I think, you know. Um, hi, sorry, uh, Taylor here. I was just wondering if I could ask a couple questions too. Um, but first, I just wanted to say thank you both for being with us today and, and sharing the amazing and incredible work that you guys do. It's, it's truly inspirational. Um, and I have two questions. So the first would be, given the fact that, oh, hello, sorry. Um, given the fact that we're still in a pandemic, um, I'm not entirely sure if I missed it, but are there ways that we can get involved and help the work that you do right now? Uh, yeah, one of the things that people do is come help pack food bags because we hand out so many that's become almost an overwhelming task and you, that's done over at the church and so you can be isolated as you do it um, it's very safe some folks are brave enough to volunteer at the door and you know we all wear masks and it's contactless we maintain distance and um so far so good so that's another way and then the other is donations um we give out hygiene kits we're we're always needing uh, shampoo, toothpaste, toothbrushes, uh, conditioner. Usually on the travel size is better. The big ones are a little hard for some of the folks to carry um, and a little harder for us to manage. Um, so, I don't know. Can you think of anything else? Yeah, uh, we don't do a big trade in clothing here, but right. people occasionally do come and, uh, you know, people come right. barefoot. Do you have any slippers? Right, donation reach. of slippers, that's, that's a good one. You know, rubber yes, slippers you. from yeah. the lungs or wherever. Right, Those are always in the especially house. large and extra large. Yeah, so does, does that? Oh, yes, okay, that, that's, that's great to hear. Um, okay. And then I had a second question actually. So um, 
what advice would you give college students or, or young people who aspire to do the work that you do? Like what kind of practical steps could we take to essentially live out God's love and, and be that vessel for Jesus and, and even emulate Dorothy Day's life or um, just that em embodying that spirit of Christ? Like what kind of practical steps would you say we could take right now? Oh boy, well, I would say start off by, you know, you are students, uh, learning is very important, you know, to, uh, you all are taking your courses in history and business and nursing or, or whatever careers, but, uh, you know, just some of the literature, you know, there's just a whole stack of books about people who have devoted their lives to, you know, the works of mercy, to promoting social justice, so educating. You know, that's the, well, people are students, that's the main role to educate, but hands-on education, you know, volunteering, you know, yeah. Barbara yeah. mentioned, you know, just people coming and just seeing the people that come for help, you know, you might, uh, your job may be just packing a bag, you know, in, in our food pantry in the church, but just getting a sense of coming out, just seeing the big line of people, you know, uh, we have a porta potty here, and, you know, we have the, People living on the street, they don't even have toilets. So I think just finding a place where you can get that exposure. Right. You know, a Catholic worker house, and as far as I know, we're the only one here in Honolulu, but there are other agencies, you know, River of Life, there are other churches uh, that, that have programs. IHS, I think they have a volunteer program. Um, but I'd say seek out a chance to, and it doesn't have to be every day, it could be once a week, you know, two or three hours. Right. Anyway, that's my input. Yeah. Okay, thank you, um, thank you yeah. both so much. Um, that definitely is very practical steps, like, like I just asked, and I think that's something we can definitely all do, whether it be small or big, and, and just take those steps to make the difference we want to see, right? Um, but thank you. Hi, you're welcome. Yeah. So, so I think we're just about running on um, our time this afternoon. Um, but if anybody else has any questions for them that you can't think of right now and you might want to ask them at a later time, then you can feel free to get in contact with any of the campus ministers at Shamanad, and I'm sure they can help you get into contact. Here comes your Catholic worker dog. I don't know if you yeah, can see it. Trying, trying to climb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's the walk time. Have kind of a uh, we. Oh, the other one, other quick thing that we do, and again, it's to try to tie into the Catholic worker tradition of some kind of public witness to peace. Once a month, right. we stand in front of the Capitol. I'm sure all of you here, wherever you are, whether you're at home or you're at work or at school, you hear that siren go off once a month, and. Uh, you may remember three years ago, the siren went off and everybody went scrambling for, uh, they thought we were being attacked by missiles. But anyway, well, we're there, when that alarm goes off every month and it's just a test, first working day, we're there with the signs, we're calling for uh, disarmament. We're calling for nuclear disarmament. You know, the, in the United Nations, 50 nations now have signed a pledge, a treaty. And the United States hasn't done it yet. So anyway, a peace witness, you know, for disarmament or demilitarization is also part of the tradition. But come join us. Come down and hold a sign for peace on uh, you know, the first working day. It's only a half hour, 11.30 to 12 at the Capitol. Father Damien is watching us as we're standing there, blessing, blessing what we're doing. Awesome. Um, so again, if you have any questions that you might think of at a later time, feel free to get into contact Thank you very with the much. campus ministers and they can connect you with them at the Wally House. Um, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a, a question, Professor Castle? <laughs> well, I actually was so impressed. St. Francis is my favorite saint, actually. And um, I just wanted to mention, uh, you mentioned Dostoevsky, that Dostoevsky wrote that the mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. 
and what your presentation gives so much inspiration and um, very important for me what i trying to bring to my students and why i joined this presentation today is your uh, what you shared very very important but very often missed idea that in service to others one can find happiness because very often people emphasize like aesthetic and uh, difficult uh, to suffer and suffering but there is another side of um, this sort of asceticism and even suffering it is really joy and the very topic of joy in service is so close to my heart that I couldn't resist to join this great presentation. And thank you so much because as you know, my background is Russian. So Dostoevsky, of course, is a very uh -huh. close our heart. And he was a great sufferer himself. And he even wrote that we can find our salvation helping those who are injured and insulted. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'll try to bring your ideas more to my class. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Awesome. Thank you, Professor Castle. It's always nice to, to see our faculty join us in these calls as well. Um, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact any of our campus ministers and they can connect you with uh, Mr. Wally or Ms. Barbara in the, in the um, Catholic Worker House. Um, I'm going to open the floor to any announcements at this time. So, Rhea or Jeremiah, if you have any announcements for um, the community, then feel free to make those announcements now. Okay. No announcements at this time. Alrighty, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our closing prayer then if there are no announcements. Um, so if we can all just center ourselves um, and remind ourselves that we're in the presence of God. And I'm going to read um, a short um, quote from Dorothy Day herself, actually, um, that we can all reflect on. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It was human love that helped me to understand divine love. Human love at its best, unselfish, glowing, illuminating our days, gives us a glimpse of the love of God for man. Love is the best thing we can know in this life, but it must be sustained by an effort of the will. It must lie still and quiet, dull and smoldering for periods. It grows through suffering and patience and compassion. We must suffer for those we love. We must endure their trials and their suffering. We must even take upon ourselves the penalties due their sins. Thus, we learn to understand the love of God for his creatures. And thus, we understand the crucifixion. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of this wonderful presentation and for this inspiring um, piece of wisdom that they have shared with us this afternoon. We thank you for all the work that they do in continuing to bring your presence to those who are marginalized and those who are often forgotten and unwanted in our community. Uh, we, continue, we continue to ask for your blessing on all of the work that they do, and we ask for your guidance and your inspiration to inspire other people to strive to reach for the same amount of work that they do in terms mm -hmm. of bringing social justice to the state of Hawaii and to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In the name amen. Of the Father, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I see Rhea and Maimola there. Do you guys have any announcements to make? Wave in there. Okay. Um, just, check our, um, uh, please don't check our social media, but we do have the Thanksgiving prayer coming up next week. Um, also, there's a small group leaders meeting tomorrow. If anybody is interested in, um, coming to check out what small group is about. It doesn't mean that when you come to the meeting, it's a commitment, it's just an informational meeting. So please come check it out. It's at 5 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, you can email me um, for any questions or if you wanna get into the Zoom, um, the Zoom link for me. So please, please come check it out. Small groups is gonna be done throughout the winter break. So you guys shouldn't have anything during that time. So it'd be a great time for you guys to connect and build community. 
to think about it, even if you don't want to be a leader, if you just want to learn more about small groups and then what it's going to be when you sign up to be in a small group, it's also a great opportunity to learn about that. Yep. Thank you, Wally House. Thank you. Thank you for Thank sharing you. with us. Also, we're at the Sasaki Shelter, everybody. I all miss you guys here. <laughs> so thank you guys for those who yeah. help. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you.